in 2013, when I went to uh, Europe with FlowTrack that summer, my goal was to ask Usain Bolt a question, you know, at a press conference or whatever it was. And the first chance I get is at the Paris Diamond League press conference, pre-race press conference. I said, any question for Usain Bolt? My hand shoots up and I didn't really have a question. Uh, <laughs> so it is very likely that we can get a professional beer mile on the calendar at some point in September, October of 2021 this year. Um, what I would suggest actually is Hey everyone, welcome back to the BeerMile.com podcast. I'm your host, Adam, with my co-host, Chris. Uh, today we have a very fun guest, uh, but first to announce the winners of last episode's contest, we have Dan, Sh- I'm probably butchering this, Shevak and Asker Tekunius. Uh, you know, hit us up in the DMs, we'll give you some swag, whatever you want from the BeerMile.com store. Also, a quick shout out or a plug uh, the deadline to like our Divi Ride Challenge is February 1st. Every like we'll get, we're going to donate a dollar to cancer research. Uh, and we'll put up the, the receipts. Probably have a fun video for that, too. Absolutely. Link in the description to that Divi video. Make sure you go like it. Also, if you're listening to this and you haven't subscribed, please do. Helps us keep bringing on top-notch guests as well. Today on the show... We have a man that's normally on the other side of the table, Chris Chavez of Sidious Mag. Uh, He's also a writer for Sports Illustrated. Chris had me on his podcast, Sidious Mag, a couple months ago. Link to that in the description if you want to take a listen. So we thought it would be only fair and fun to have him on the other side of the table to join our podcast as the interviewee and get a little insight into his life upbringing, his career with running, his career uh, in journalism and reporting and covering pro running. He's the go-to man in the sport of running. He put out 61 podcasts in 2020. Chris takes us behind the scenes of Sidious Mag and of some of the big events that he's attended, including the Olympics in 2016. He also gives some funny stories and some inside scoop on some pro runners. We also talk about the 2021 Beer Mile Showdown between the beer milers like myself, world record holder Corey Belmore, against pro runners such as Craig Engels, Eric Jenkins, uh, and a few others. Trying to keep it pretty low key, so don't go spreading, you know, spreading some rumors until we know things are for sure. Yeah. If just, you know, you know. If you know, you know, just keep listening to the Beer Mob podcast and we'll keep you updated as always. So please out there, smash that subscribe. I see you watching, I see you not subscribed, smash it. 92% of you people aren't subscribed. If you do subscribe, you can win cool things. We'll do more stupid videos. If you have any more challenges uh, that we can do for charitable causes, comment them in the below in the video and, and we'll think about doing them. Absolutely, any challenges, any series, anyone, any guests that you would like us to have on, we're game for anything. So hit us up, let us know, we'll make it happen. And we'll probably also send you some uh, beermile.com gear, some free swag in the process. So let's jump into it. Our conversation with Chris Chavez. This was a blast. Hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the show, Chris Chavez. And to kick things off, congrats on a big year with Sidious Mag, especially the podcast. I think you had 61 episodes in yeah. 2020, so more than one a week. Um, this man's putting in work. We're glad to have you on. Thanks, man. Yeah, you were one of the episodes. I got to meet Adam while I was out in Chicago for a little bit. Um, yeah, just kind of grinding away. Podcasting has been sort of like the medium that I've really like grown to love over the last like couple um the last couple of years and so definitely don't want to slow down and just keep it going a bit yeah absolutely uh it's been fun to see your coverage and staking your claim on you know having the the access and the story behind all the pro runners out there so it's uh it's great it's my main one of my main news sources if not the main news source of of pro running and uh yeah absolutely love what you're doing yeah, I like to hear that. And plus, like what you guys are doing, too, with like BeerMile.com and BeerMile Media has just been it's been great because it's like, you know, I thought for a while, I, I mean, 
when I was in college, I thought the beer mall was super cool. And then like over a while it hit, like, I think we talked about it on the podcast that we did together, where it was like, it hit this part where it got a little bit too mainstream. And then uh, now it's kind of like definitely finding, I think a little bit more of its appeal again. And so, um, yeah, you guys are getting super creative and I, and I want to con- continue to see more of that too. Yeah, definitely. Is it is this weird for you being in the interviewee position instead of the interviewer? I mean, I, I really I wanted to have you on because a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I thought it, I you know it was great to be on your podcast a couple months ago, and I thought you know I've I've never really gotten to hear your story in depth for an hour, so I, I kind of want to hear it. Yeah, I did a couple at uh, last year at some point. Like I I went on like Alley on the Run, um, but we didn't really do like a whole like career deep dive. And then I was on La Rundown, which is like a Canadian podcast. Um, and I've done like uh, the Shakeout with like, and that's another like Canadian podcast. Canadians seem to like me, so and like they're the friendliest people, so I don't mind that. But um, yeah, I'm down to to get into it. To, you know, at any point. But for me, really, just it starts in running at least for me didn't start until high school um i was a very average high school sprinter um i only joined the track team because all the guys around my locker um were on the track team and like they were just super cool guys and so i wanted to hang out with them more and so i decided to join uh and at that point just like got into sprinter uh, into the sprint group because i had no stamina whatsoever when it came to or endurance um and i was also like a member of like the school newspaper because like that was like sort of like something that I got into as well as a uh, freshman. So I didn't join until the soph- sophomore year uh, for track. And I can just remember those like really early days of um, trying to break 30 seconds in a 200. Like that was how below average I was at the time. And um, I nothing beyond 400 meters mm-hmm. ever sounded good to me. Like I, I hated it. Uh, so yeah, and it's crazy to think about now because like all I do now is just look forward to running, you know, a half marathon or marathon. And so we're talking like way, way, way more distance. Um, so yeah, no, for me, that's where it all begins. Did they kind of start together like the journalism and running or did that kind of did that relationship mm-hmm. develop further on into high school or early college? So the journalism, I think, came first because I guess what I like to tell people is that uh, when I try, like I growing up, I wanted to be, um, you know, Derek Jeter's replacement on the New York Yankees. And so baseball was like my first sport. It's still to this day, like my favorite sport. I, I watched the Yankees a ton. Um, and so I wanted to be like the next Derek Jeter, but I actually went to like a summer program where I was like more focused on like my academics post like seventh, eighth, then like uh, sixth, seventh and eighth grade where those summers were spent more in the classroom than they were in uh, like on a little league field or something like that. So my athletic development was kind of stunted because I was instead being a nerd. Uh, and so I didn't get those summers. So what I decided, so by the time I show up to, you know, freshman baseball tryouts, I'm not any good. I thought I was cause I'd, you know, would play in my backyard by myself sometimes, but, and I did play some little league, but, um, it was just not good enough to make a team. So I got cut, I think like first or second round and I needed to figure out like, okay, how am I going to remain close to uh, sports? If I'm not going to be Derek Jr. on the field, like what's the closest I can get? And I figured, okay, it could be the broadcast route or like the, the reporting route. And so from there, you know, I remember picking up the newspaper every day um, in high school. It was like the New York post and it was like, 25 cents or 50 cents which is kind of crazy because it's not the price anymore and like it makes me sound pretty damn old um (laughs) but i would do that and so like i got hooked on the sports section and so instead of um you know being the guy that was like being written about i'd be the one doing the writing and that's kind of like my whole thought process into um getting into uh into reporting and so track reporting specifically didn't even happen until college Hmm. Got it. Got it. That's, do you think that switching from sprinting to longer distance running being more of a passion is just because it's really hard to be a sprinter after really after high school, if you don't, if you're not on a college team, there's just not really access in, in races. Oh yeah. Race. So everyone. No, totally. It, you no, know, that's exactly it. So like, um, I might, I ended up finishing with like a 25 one PR for the 200. And that was like my proudest one. And I just realized like that's not going to get you 
um, Elaine at any sort of like invitational or meet. So the opportunities to even race or run were like going to be limited. And then, like, I remember that was that 25 one was running like my last ever race. So like I was only trending upward because I remember I also used to skip part of outdoor season by blaming it on my allergies. Like I just like decided that being outdoors and like, it was around like April, that kind of stuff. I was just like, it wasn't in the mood to really run. So I just like would, would scratch most of the season due to allergies. Um, but yeah, I, I think what ended up happening was I got to college and one of my buddies uh, from high school was also, also ended up at Marquette up in Milwaukee. And he was putting on the freshman 15 a little bit quicker than uh, most people. And I just decided like, I don't want to put on the freshman 15. I want to do something to stay in shape. And so I just was like, I'm going to have to start doing um, five K's and like five K seems to be like a good distance. People do them for charity, I think. And like, you can enter a 5k race on most weekends. So it's like, all right, if I could just start doing 5k's, that'd be fine. So, you know, incrementally, you know, ran two to three miles a day. Um, and then I just like one day watched the New York city marathon on TV and decided like, Hey, I want it. I want to do that someday because like New York is home for me and seeing it, it was just like the, the city was a huge party. So I was just like one day I want to do that. Maybe it's next year. And so I entered the lottery for the following year. And then like, Thankfully, didn't get in because I would not have been prepared, but slowly worked my way up, did a couple half marathons. And then and then that ultimately, by the time I got into I got into the Chicago Marathon for 2013 and I was only 19 at the time. Um, my first goal ever with distance running was breaking uh, two hours for the half marathon. And that's just like how amateur I was at, at all of this is just like, and how new it was it's just like, I'd be running eight minute pace for the most part on and like slower on like some of these days. Um, so I figured once I broke two hours in the half marathon, then let's do it. Let's double it up. Let's do four for the full. And so, um, Chicago, 2013 was my first ever marathon. I ended up, it was a perfect day, beautiful day, ended up running like 418 or something like a 417 and uh, like I didn't have really any ex any excuse except that it was my first one and I just didn't have it on that day um but I was hooked because I needed to get under four and I wanted to do it in New York so it's like I I knew I was gonna have another marathon some other day um but I just didn't like and then like New York the, the first time around I do it goes poorly so like I like I needed to take multiple cracks at this, but for some reason I just like kept kept coming back. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny in the marathon. There's always these like in the mile you just have like a sub five and then a sub four. You have those kind of those key mm -hmm. time barriers in the marathon. You kind of have endless because you have like the sub five, the sub four, the sub three, and then you also have all the Boston increments within there. And then you get yeah. like sub two forty, sub two thirty, sub two, and then it's just like. I don't know. There's always something to shoot for, no matter what you're at. You're always like, oh, I can do five minutes better, 10 minutes better. So it's kind of addicting in that regard. <laughs> oh, 100%. And like, you know, it was kind of, it was supposed to be poetic in a way where um, I didn't end up getting under four hours until like my third try. And it was at Boston of all places where like a friend of mine got me into the race through like um, his sponsor or whatever it was, uh, I managed to get a bib. So I've never really qualified for Boston. That's like my next big goal is to qualify for Boston. But, um, I ended up doing it there and, you know, now I've done all six world marathon majors, you know, it's much easier for me to do it and to check these boxes because as a member of the media, they, they do reserve bibs sometimes for, for the media. So like, I'm able, I have that sort of privilege when it comes to it. So it's like, yeah, some people will knock it for sure. But like, I've still trained and done all of them. Uh, and it was supposed to be 2020 was supposed to be my 10th marathon. And I was going to go back to Chicago to do it because I love a flat course. I'm not a hills guy whatsoever. And so I wanted to run Chicago for my 10th one. And it was supposed to be, uh, you know, first ever one, I was trying to go under four this time around, I want to go under three. So it's like, it would be really cool to skip every single, you know, three blank, uh, you know, in a, in a span of 10 marathons. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so going back to when you're, you're finishing your time at Marquette, how did you get started in your career, um, in reporting journalism and, in was, was baseball still a pursuit you wanted to get into at that time? And, and when did you really go all in on running and give us a little bit of that origin story? Yeah. So it, it, it all happened while I was at Marquette. So during my 
freshman year, um, as I'm like watching sort of, uh, no, no, I just decided to stay in on a Friday night. Like all my friends are going out and there was a day where it was a, it was in May. Um, I just stayed in and some random high school buddy of mine retweeted a link to flow track was broadcasting oxy um like the meet out in california and i'm just in my dorm room and i click into it and i'm just watching this is my first time ever watching like a track and field live stream and just a couple weeks before i'd run my first ever 5k and i ran like 21 minutes or something like that and I remember watching as like Dathan Rittenhine was in the race and uh, he didn't end up winning, but whatever it was, he had like a breakthrough performance. It was like, uh, it showed that he was back and like healthy again. And I remember watching his interview and he was so hyped up and, and like excited to be healthy and like competing again that I was like, wow, like that guy is so fast. Cause he just ran like 13, something like this guy might win the Olympics. And like the Olympics were rolling around just like a couple months later in, uh, in London. But I, at that point, like I'm one of those people who would tune into the Olympics just to watch you say bolt run. And then like after five, 10 minutes, like that was it for me. Like I didn't really care about the distance events, but something about that night really piqued my interest where I'm like, there's all these other athletes and like, they're, they seem pretty cool. So like, why don't I go back and like watch some old races and some more interviews and like get to know some of these other people because there is much more to offer to the sport than just Usain Bolt. And so over the course of like the next couple of weeks, I just got hooked and just started watching a lot of YouTube, reading some books and like old Sports Illustrated articles. And I remember just seeing that the Diamond League in New York was going to happen a couple of weeks later. And for me, I was like, all right, well, if it's happening in New York and I'm going to be home for the summer, I think that summer I was even like working at a summer camp or something like that. I really wasn't doing like any sort of journalism internship. I just like shot Ryan Fenton an email out of the blue. And he was like the, you know, one of the heads at flow track at the time. And I was like, Hey, I'm a journalism student at Marquette. And like, um, I was, I'm in New York. I'd be interested in helping you guys with whatever you guys need on, uh, for the, adidas grand prix and so like he was like cool let's hook you up with a credential and we'll, we'll just have you out there and so it was super easy at that point flow track only had like 20 something thousand followers on twitter i remember that because like they gave me the login to live tweet the meet and so that's what i was doing and then after a while there was like a point where there were too many athletes coming through at the same time like a couple races happened back to back where they just handed me a camera and they're like, can you go get some interviews? And I was like, sure. At that point, I, I, I didn't, the cool part was like, I didn't get starstruck around any of these athletes because I really didn't know too much about them. Like the only, per so the first person I ever go into an interview for, not even like, I can't even recall it an interview because all I did was really just like say something and like stick my hand into like this scrum of reporters was Oscar Pistorius, which is like crazy to think about. Um, and like I remember I knew who he kind of was because I'd seen headlines about this guy with no legs um, competing and and how like it was a somewhat controversial beforehand. And so and then I did some other interview um, and I showed to the guys at Flow Track at that point, it was like Mark Floriani, who started the company um, and Alex Lore. They we're just kind of like, cool. And like, thanks for, thanks for helping out. And I just showed them like, I wasn't really too phased and I knew what I was doing. So they wanted me to continue helping them out. And I also offered up to like do more writing for their site because at that point, Flowtrack was just so video heavy. And I was like, first and foremost, a writer. Um, so I was like, let me help you guys out by upping some writing on your site and just doing breaking news and all this kind of stuff. So I volunteered to do that. And they called me up and asked me to go help them out at a meet at, at Wisconsin. And it was like the Wisconsin cross country meet went there. And I remember I spent like a night or two just because this was going to be their first ever attempt at like streaming the whole cross country race. What they ended up doing was filming it and then uploading it to flow track and then adding the commentary afterwards. And my job there was to help them out with the commentary by providing them notes. And I remember putting together like a stats package with like <laughs> random like facts about uh, some person who might end up finishing like 40th or or like 50th. Like I just did, overworked myself for no reason. But to yeah. them, I showed them that like, hey, I care. And like, I pay attention to detail and all this kind of stuff. So from there, that meet was like a hit and I showed them like kind of my work ethic. And then they said, you know, can you go out to this meet 
in Minnesota. And I said, well, I don't have a car. I really can't get out there. Um, I didn't even have a license at that point. I'm from New York and like, I don't, I get around on the subway. I have like one of the electric scooters here in my apartment. Cause I, don't, I still don't really drive. Um, and so I was like, I can't make it out to Minnesota as easy as I was, uh, to get out to Madison. And so they're like, no, 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 we'll fly you out there. And then that just kind of kicked off. Like, how about, you know, Florida relays and how about Peyton Jordan and all these meets. So I sacrificed those really fun college weekends in Milwaukee, um, to be able to travel and cover these meets. And in, in turn, like what happened was I got to know a lot of the coaches and athletes and so started to build that sort of rapport with them. And eventually like that same, that following summer, they asked me to go to Europe and that was just like a game changer, like being embedded with the athletes out there. Cause when you go out there, like the athletes really do stick together. It's you'd love seeing a familiar face and someone else who speaks English and that kind of stuff. So being within, you know, kind of that, that tight knit group really helped out, help me out with like building some of these connections that are still really valuable to me to this day. So, um, I mean, really my, my career within covering track and field does, go back to just that night by chance staying in on that Friday night, but also the, the initiative of emailing Ryan Fenton and just happen like happened to catch flow track at the time that they were, because nowadays, like when I do get that question from like a high school, you know, senior or a kid in college is like, how did you get to where it is that you were? And it's, it's tricky because I do have to attribute it to the timing of it too. It's like, Nowadays, the entry point maybe is a little bit tougher because so many of these places have grown and taken off. But, you know, you, once you do have those opportunities presented in front of you, I think you do have to do your best to seize that moment. Yeah, absolutely. And so with with flow track, then uh, what what made you decide to switch? So were you I guess, did you join Sports Illustrated while you were still with flow track or was that after um, leaving flow track, joining Sports mm -hmm. Illustrated? And what made you jump into that? Yeah, so with I did flow track from 2012 to 2014, um, and at that point it was. But before that, I did an internship with ESPN the summer after my junior year of college. So one summer I went to um, Europe for flow track, and then the following summer I went to Bristol, Connecticut, and I worked out of the ESPN headquarters, which is really cool because you get to see like. Stephen A. Smith on like the cafeteria line. And then like, I remember they were filming a, um, this is sports center commercial. And I tried my best to walk in the background, like multiple times during takes. Um, uh, and I never made it. Um, but like, that was an awesome opportunity. Cause I got to get my feet wet back into covering mainstream sports. And so I remember covering two days of the Mets, um, alongside, um, Adam Rubin, who was like their beat writer at the time. And so he, like, but then here was like the crazy wake up call where I remember dreaming about being like the Yankees beat writer and like calling, you know, I think the famous phrase by like Derek Jeter is like calling Yankee stadium, like his office. And that's what I wanted. But then after doing it for two days with the Mets, I was so turned off by like the lifestyle where you get to the ballpark at like 1 PM and then you don't leave until like late after the game, like maybe an hour or two after like, you have to do all the interviews and who knows how late the night is going to be. And eating wise in those two days, I ate so much just like shit food from like the, uh, from the place where it was like, I, I just was like, how do you, how do you do this for 162 games? Like that lifestyle just really wasn't for me. Um, when I realized it, um, so it, it kind of, you know, left a little bit of like, it, it, it tarnished that dream I had, like if I could do it perfectly and, you know, it wasn't as difficult that lifestyle, then maybe I'd go back to it. But like, there was just something that turned me off from it. And so, you know, I, I kind of continued doing a lot of r running, uh, writing for ESPN and my boss there, uh, was a big runner, uh, like a running fan. And so he enjoyed it and asked me to just kind of stay on while I was still going into my senior year of college. So I got to cover the the Chicago Marathon, the New York City Marathon, LA, London, um, for ESPN.com while I was still a student, um, which was very cool to kind of like realize like, oh, I'm still writing for ESPN while I'm wrapping up like my senior year. And so I was fairly confident I was going to get a job offer from 
ESPN when the when like it was all over. Um, and I also initiated talks with Sports Illustrated around February or something like that. They're in New York City. Someone I went to college with was working there and introduced me to some people there. So it came down to um, it came down to deciding whether I would go out to Connecticut or go to stay in New York and, and come to uh, Sports Illustrated. And Connecticut was not appealing to me. Um, you know, born and raised in New York City, always wanted to come back. Um, I think it's the greatest city in the world. Even after my month in Chicago, I still <laughs> have to come back, come on, I believe. <laughs> uh, but and also like I recognize that Sports Illustrated has like a really rich tradition of covering the Olympics. Like they've got some awesome covers of magazines and like they they've done it traditionally. And so I wanted to be part of SI's Olympic team for 2016. And so I made that a goal for myself. And so um in accepting like the job in 2015, I wanted to use that final year to really prove myself to my bosses and, and put me on that team for the Olympics in 16. And so, um, yeah, in a way, uh, it, it, it seems like the way I should phrase it for like a dating app would be to tell people like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready for the Olympics. And so like, I, <laughs> and without explaining that, exactly. you know, I'm getting ready to go and work there and like, right. But, you know, I just uh, like to tell people, yeah, I'm getting ready for the Olympics. And that's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm getting ready for the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. So so what's your split? And so I think a lot of people know Sidious Mag, the name by the podcast. Um, there, there's more to Sidious Mag than that. Uh, but also then you still work for Sports Illustrated as well. So what does that breakdown look like in your mm-hmm your time each day and time per week and how do you how do you split that and what are your requirements you know job wise for sports illustrated what do you have to deliver to them yeah it's a great question because like really i think when so kind of to sum up uh, where and, and to pick off where i was just kind of like bring, uh, so bringing up the olympics is like it it came a dream come true i got to go in 2016 and that was amazing like um i was at the trials and i was at the olympics and like for me those are the two things I look forward to going to um, in my role. I know that Sports Illustrated doesn't have the budget to send me to like, you know, Peyton Jordan and all these kind of meets, like, because like the, the audience doesn't care about that kind of stuff. Like it's more of a mainstream sports audience, but if it was like the NFL, like, yeah, you, you find the money to, to, to go to that kind of stuff. But anyway, so I go to the Olympics in 16. It was amazing. And I come back and sort of like, I have this case of writer's block, which is like, what I realize it's a real thing. Like, and people talk about it where it's just like, you have this in like ability where you just hit a wall and you wonder like, well, what's next. And for me, I realized that uh, from 2012 to 2016, I was really busting my ass and going to like all these track meets, like a Florida relay is a a, uh, Peyton Jordan, Stanford invitational, whatever it was that we as like people who follow the sport and track nerds, just like we care about that kind of stuff. And, uh, and I got to Sports Illustrated and I know that the audience for Sports Illustrated doesn't care about, you know, Florida Relays. Um, But I still did even after the Olympics. And so I I wanted to find a way to continue to channel that sort of energy that I have um, and, and that passion for covering the sport without having to bug my editors at Sports Illustrated about, hey, here's a 500 word post about, uh, I don't know, some someone like Abdi Abdurrahman or something like that. And like, my my editor just doesn't have the time to 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 deal with that kind of stuff. So I needed I wanted to create a place for it, and at the same time offer up something totally different. Like that's, um, and I'm a big Bill Simmons you know fan. Like I I love reading Grantland. I love The Ringer. Um, and I thought about okay, so running has flow track. You go there, you watch all the videos, um, live live events and that kind of stuff. You got Let's Run, which is the homepage of all the links and and that kind of stuff. And then I was like, so you've got your news and you've got your videos. But I was like, there was still, I think, a sort of place lacking for like the commentary and the humor and also a little bit of like relatability. And so I decided to team up with a couple of my friends who I'd met throughout the running community in you know the four years that I'd been covering it. And I was like, all right, let's do something as a group um, that is a little bit different. And so, you know, we came out hot out of the gates, just writing a bunch of posts that were really funny, somewhat um, analytical sometimes. And then at, at the same time, like relatable. I think that was a really big thing too, is that there was a lot of, 
things that people would read and be like, okay, like that's what I'm going through right now. And it's like, and I'm still, it, uh, the way someone described it once was like, we are, we cater to that audience who's like, red wants a runner and like is still wanting to give the sport like an honest shot and like continuing to try and get the best out of themselves. And I love that when I heard it from, we got it in like an email or, or some sort of comment somewhere. And I thought it was great. Um, so in a way I made this site with, you know, a couple friends and it was just kind of flying under the radar. Cause I really didn't know what it was going to be. Yeah. Um, at least to my bosses. So I never really asked for permission at first. Like I was like, you know what? I'll ask for <laughs> forgiveness later. Yeah. Um, and I did get called into a meeting at one point. I was asked about it and I was asked like, what is it? And I was like, well, it's a blog. I mean, my buddies just kind of started to nerd out on, on running just so that I don't have to bug, you know, editors here at sports illustrated about it. Um, and so they were co totally cool with it. But we, the way we drew the line was like anything that I originally report, um, if I have any sort of news to break, then it obviously goes to Sports Illustrated. Mm -hmm. um, if I've got um, like a feature story, uh, then it goes to Sports Illustrated. So like if I'm going to write about the New York City Marathon and like Shalane Flanagan's like last shot or something like that, that's going to go on Sports Illustrated, um, not on SI, uh, not on Sidious. Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing, too, is like I would never use sports illustrated's name to get an interview for Sidious. Like that was just like a, a given, but yeah. I think over time, like what it's become is just like at, at this point, like now people just kind of know me um, yeah. and will just sit down and, and talk to me for whichever place it ends up. And it's kind of given me that, that freedom to have these two little avenues to, to go down where does, does the sports illustrated reader know about the marathon project? No, not really. Um, but the Sidious Mag audience definitely does. And so here I'm going to throw out four podcasts their way and, and do that kind of work. There's times where like, there's a little bit of crossover where, you know, and, and it gets to be a little bit of a balance, but I think I've, I've done a good job of it um, in separating sort of like that capital J journalist on one side. And then like, the other one, it's like where you get a little bit more flair and taste of like, oh, it's the legs are feeling good guy and that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so then for Sports Illustrated, it, it it kind of it makes more sense now that you're saying that you just explained that. But I've always kind of thought, like, why would they want someone that's working for them to also be spending their time doing creative work elsewhere as well? So it do you just have like a set number of like features, articles, et cetera, that you have to provide to them. How does that arrangement work? I coming from someone who I don't really know how the journalism world is set up. Is it so, like is it like salary based or is it articles per month based? How does that work? No, I'm I'm a, I'm a full time salary employee for Sports Illustrated. I'm I'm a staff writer there. Um, where, but my my day to day job is nine to five for Sports Illustrated. Okay. Where. Um, I quarterback the breaking news team and sort of like, I oversee like a team of like, you know, 10 writers or so. Um, and we kind of garner new, we write news stories based off whatever's happening around the world. So if I see someone, you know, Tom Brady tears his ACL in the middle of a game or something like that, then it's on me to assign it to a writer and be like, okay, get me a story on Tom Brady tearing his ACL in like 10 minutes, I'll edit it. And then like we shoot it out to all these different places. So it's really fast paced, like new stuff. And yeah. at the same time, I'm also doing like reporting and writing on running and Olympics and track and field projects. So that's kind of like how I spend my nine to five. And yeah. then from there, outside of that, um, taping podcasts, editing them, uh, doing social media posts for Sidious and all that kind of stuff and then at some point i'll try and find the time to sleep but um, <laughs> that's kind of like how it all comes down to it and so like it's it, if i had a bigger budget with like Sidious, i would hire podcast producers and like a couple other writers and stuff like that to to just generate more content on the site but for the most part like it really is just a passion project that i've got going on the side right now that happens to generate some ad revenue from time to time. But um, that's kind of, that's, that's all, all what it boils down to. And, and the goal with it is just keep growing it until, you know, who knows if I someday down the road want to try and do it on a full-time basis or, um, or, you know, I don't know, like someone wants to invest in it and then like it blows up. We'll, we'll see. Like there's, there's, I think potential with it because, over time, like I feel like it's gotten a good grip on that sort of audience that 
that we really did hook on to in 2017 and it stayed with us. It's like super loyal people and um, the branding community has totally embraced it. So um, I don't want to stop doing it anytime soon, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is like a, a lot of work, extra work that I put on myself. But the reason I keep doing it is because people enjoy it. Like when I see the numbers and that kind of stuff, the number of downloads, the number of, you know, followers and comments and growth and all that kind of stuff, like it's worth it. Like I, I don't want to pull the plug on something that people now seem to like. Yeah. That so, is funny. It's like probably to consider it a side project. It's like one of the most prolific side projects, at least like from my point of view. <laughs> that's that's what I thought as well. So my my assumption was more that you just had like say a set number of articles to deliver, kind of kind of more I guess the freelancer model with SI versus actually the the nine to five. So yeah, I mean, no, that's yeah, even, now I'm, now I don't feel bad about you know us doing a podcast <laughs> outside of work. It's like I got no excuses. I gotta yeah, I gotta seriously. get on my game. <laughs> So that that's awesome. How, yeah, it's kind of what it comes down to. It, and, and like, it's it's crazy because a lot of people don't really realize that, that that's the right. behind the scenes behind Sidious that like really sometimes it is just me. Um, and it, yeah, for better or for worse, uh, that's the case. And, you know, I'd love for people to invest more in it. We're sort of like if there were more advertisers or sponsors, because in a way, like, yeah, I honestly could pull the plug on it like tomorrow and then people do lose out on it. But so like there is I feel like it has some value. So I don't know. We'll see. Do you think there's um like it, it seems like this very unique thing to running where for a lot of sports, there's not this level of amateurism. There's not like a collective group of people who are very into the sport and also like doing it themselves. Do you think there are other sports that you could expand to? Is that the move? Is that something you thought about before? Oh man, and it's it's tricky because like we, I, like I'm a big baseball guy. I know some of the other guys who've worked on the site before are like huge NBA guys, and like it's like the temptation's always there to like, oh, uh, why don't we just like launch like a little part of the site that is dedicated to those sports? But I think what it comes down to sort of is what I recognize is unique and special about Sidious is because of the attachment to to me. At sort of like the at the top end of it was that you know that we have s blogs and and sites that launch constantly and and this is kind of an example that you see a lot of the time when someone is like a college student um it who wants to be like an nfl writer or something like that right so i'll give you this example where a college student will just launch an nfl blog and they'll spew their takes and 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 that kind of stuff on the nfl but I always take the step uh, or take the perspective of the viewer and the consumer in that sense where it's like, why would they want to, why would they care about what that person says when they really don't have like, not the, not the experience of playing the game because like, that's another thing. Like there are great sites that are run by people who have no experience in, in participating in such sports. You could see, you see it in the NFL and all that kind of stuff, NBA, Yeah, but I think it's just like with running, it was just like, I think I, because of my time with FlowTrack and ESPN and Sports Illustrated, there's credibility that comes to it where I have covered the sport on the high school, college, pro Olympic level, um, where there is, there's a little bit of um, credibility to it. And so um, that would be where I, as I have no credibility when it comes to the MLB, I'll just like be really angry about the Yankees not signing enough people or like that kind of stuff where yeah. I, yeah, it'd be fun for me to be able to vent and, and, and like get that out of my system. But really it's like, I don't, I don't see the value that it offers to another person. Whereas like I I'll stay in my lane and stick to sort of running and providing commentary and insights and, whatever it is through that um, be, because of the access that, that I have. So alternative to what Adam just said, then is, is the goal to be the monopoly on running uh, because so like the, the Sidious mag podcast network, there's more shows than just, you know, Chris Chavez. So I'm, I'm curious, is that the goal? Just acquire every podcast and running and just, I'm, <laughs> I'm the guy, I'm the running guy. If, and then that way you're the shoe in at every meet you're, you're the main commentator, so on and so forth. 
so uh, no, I would not be the guy to monopolize on on it. Like I'm just kind of, I come, I'm kind of a little bit more grounded. Where it's like I'm not gonna go for like total world domination <laughs> on, on something like this. Where, uh, you know, I I realize that like podcasting is sort of like the avenue we I decided to to take the site uh, two years ago. Um, I was like, all right, this is something that people really enjoy that we do. Um, let's go all in on it. So I scaled back on the writing. I definitely want to bring it back because the writing was really awesome for us. But um, podcasting has been the way to go. And for me, taking sort of that page out of Bill Simmons's playbook a bit where you look at a site like The Ringer, amazing writing and commentary on like pop culture and sports and, and politics sometimes. Um, but what it comes down to is there's just so much to so much more to offer and a lot of it is through podcasts. And so um, we've got my show, which is, and a lot of them are very interview based shows, but that's also because I don't have a podcast producer that will be able to edit more of some of these narrative type shows. Like, would I love to do like an investigative serial esque type show? A hundred percent. Like it'd be amazing. And we don't have that in running really. Um, but I, I don't have the time to, to do it and produce it and edit it. Um, so yeah, I mean, like, so we've got my show, Dana Show, which is also interview based, but it is more focused on women and people and entrepreneurs and very successful people within the running space. So I saw, all right, let's let's go with that. Um, Fobble Show is showrunners. We he just sits down and interviews people he wants to watch movies with, which is like very much the rewatchables from The Ringer. So just apply it to running and that kind of stuff. Pretty much a lot of it is take something good and and like flip it into the running version of it um like there's a trivia show that i, I kind of want to launch soon very much based off of another model but just apply it to running um runners of new york city is a, another interview sh based show that i do but very hyper local focus on the new york city running community um track and field uh history is just a 15 minute like podcast episode thing where i was just like this guy knows a lot about track and field history let's it'll be like fireside chats with like grandpa jesse squire and that kind of <laughs> stuff where it's like this old guy just telling you about old things in the sport like there's like there's value in all these little different things um so yeah i mean some of the creativity like isn't at the end of the day that original but like i i enjoy it like and it's been the medium that i've thrived in the best so far in sort of this space and the crazy part is like i don't do any podcasting for sports illustrated um and that gives me i think a little bit more freedom to to do with with sidious true it's almost like a break from your from your day job a little bit oh yeah totally so that's yeah that's awesome yeah it it, it always baffles me like how big podcasts have become i mean that's my preferred medium yeah. for for news for learning really for for anything yeah. so it it really and well i guess for us we're going the we're going the video route. That's our differentiator. We're going the video route because um, we know we can't compete with you, Chris. So we are going to stick with the video version. And uh, well, I I just decided doing stupid challenges. That's the other. That's the sidekick to the video version of the podcast. I, I decided. I think that we're. I'm going to start tossing up the City Smack podcast. Like, but it's just literally going to be the Zoom call version of what I do without the intro and all that kind of stuff. So I I don't have the editing the time to edit the way that you guys do. Um, but like, I think that's a, like a, an initiative I'll take in 2021 is just take that zoom call and just toss it up because really there's, I think it came down. I, I forget who it was, um, that pointed out to me. It was like rich roll has a great podcast. Um, and he just interviews all these people and it's the numbers are millions and millions of downloads. He puts it up on YouTube and it only gets, you know, maybe a couple thousand sort of views, but it's still you know, something. And like, that's how some people maybe prefer to consume the show. Like, that's how I feel about sometimes like uh, the occasional Joe Rogan episode is like, I think it's much more entertaining to watch, watch it on YouTube um, as opposed to listening to it. So um, everyone, everyone has a different style um, to it. And YouTube does have like a lot, a lot of potential. Yeah, exactly. And I think most people do prefer to, I mean, I prefer to consume most podcasting just, you know, via ear while I'm out and about doing stuff. But there is, there is the benefit of having that like face to put to someone's voice, which, which can add more, um, you know, report camaraderie with, with someone as well as the, 
possibility of getting into that YouTube recommendation algorithm and getting pumped to the moon. And I mean, in full, <laughs> in full transparency, I mean, our, our, our uh, video with athlete special and Ali Ostrander um, happened to get just recommended to everyone on YouTube. And so that, that episode has like 14,000 more listens than we yeah. have on any other episode because of the YouTube piece, you know, adding into it. So yeah, like, I guess that is like very specific to YouTube. Like there is no anchor or Spotify, Apple, Apple podcast. Not to the same extent, right? like less people go there for just binging a stream of recommended podcasts or videos versus YouTube. So, yeah. Um, so no, yeah. I think and listen, I, think I was, you guys are successful in your, your play to try and, and, and get a little bit of the, uh, athlete special clout because I tried the same exact thing. I took a little clip from the podcast and I put it up on the city of Smag YouTube and it hasn't done anything. So congrats on nailing that algorithm. <laughs> I mean, we, we put up another video with him and that one didn't get any, get any clout. So no, I mean, that it, it's crazy. Yeah. The YouTubers, they're on another level. The clout that yeah. they have is, is crazy. I will, so. I will say like, it's totally not part of the recommendation algorithm, but I was listening to uh, the clean sport collective podcast. Like one of the latest one, I think it is, might actually be the latest one with Shalane and both her and Kara gave you like a quick shout out. And I was like, I was like, Oh sweet. Like <laughs> <laughs> we're interviewing Chris on Wednesday. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I just got a couple texts about that clip, and then I was like, "Wait, what?" Uh, because if someone texted me was like, "Shalane just called you like uh, a great guy on like uh, the Clean Sport podcast," I'm like, "What part? Or, like, what what minute and all that kind of stuff?" And then I listened to it. I actually just put it up on my Instagram story because I took that clip, and then I um, changed. I was gonna add it to my bio uh, where it was like, "Quote such a great guy, Shalane Flanagan." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, put that on your resume. I mean, seriously. put it on my hinge profile or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Let's let's try to get a little a little spicier, if we may. Um, so you have the reputation in the running world. We've established that. Um, you've met all these runners. You have like two hundred and something episodes of the Sidious Mag, and I didn't even know there were two hundred different you know pro runners out there. So, <laughs> props to you on that. Um, so. Let, let's start here. What's the best party you've ever been to at a you know post-race party event with, with pro runners? Oh, this is a good question. And so like, this will get a little bit spicy because, you know, th I've never been asked that sort of question. And, you know, in a way, like the capital J journalist would be like, you know, I'm not going to go to that sort of party. And like, I'm, you know, and like, and here's the thing. It's like running is such a small sport where that line between being friends with like the athlete and then like being the reporter, you have to be careful with it. But also at the same time, it's like, it's the sport that I do. Like I run, like I, I can be friends with Kyle Merber and we can relate to each other as sort of runners. And so like, uh, like I, so I, do I consider Kyle Merber a friend? Yes. Um, could I write about him for sports illustrated? That's where it gets a little bit murky. Will I have him on my podcast? Yeah, that's much easier. So it's like, it's also, I've created that sort of avenue to have a little bit of sort of that freedom. So the line like does get blurred a little bit. So that's me stalling to try and think of like <laughs> what exactly the party would be. Um, I will say this, like uh, the University of Notre Dame track team throws a good uh, party after the Mayo Invitational every single uh, year. And so kind of in sort of maybe that might have been like the heyday of sort of like my party boy days being you know 20 years old or something like 21 uh, and ending up at some sort of house party in south bend indiana but having the time of my life uh that could well so that that would be that sticks out to me as like the good old days i'm trying to think of like uh in uh in europe in the summer, I, I'll say this. Yeah, this isn't like a party, um, but it's after the Houston uh, track meet or whatever it is. There's that one fast meet out in the Netherlands, but it's like right on the border of um, of the Netherlands and Belgium and that kind of stuff. A lot of people end their season that day. Um, like that's it for them in the summer and the summer circuit's over. So the bus will go back to we'll get all the Americans and all these athletes who've been training in Leuven for the summer. Leuven's my favorite place in the world. Um, and bring them back there that night at the town square, like is just like an electric festival, just like 
people are out. And the thing about Leuven is that that's where Stella Artois, I'm pretty sure, is is brewed. Um, so all the all the bars they're having on tap, it's super cheap. It's it's a great time. And yeah, and I've seen I've seen some pro runners like getting rowdy uh, <laughs> there. And and at the same like at the same time, I was 19 and 21 the two times that I've gone out and done that. Uh, and so yeah, those I, I would say if you're looking for a good party, time it with the Houston track meet and go to Leuven. Be there that night. Someone will be out there having a good time. <laughs> Speaking of uh, like you know, you kind of touched on the relationship that you maintain with a lot of the athletes. What has been like the most nervous you've been for and, and who was it for an interview? Ooh, like the easy answer would probably be bolt. Um, you saying bolt because, okay. So the first ever time I, in 2013, when I went to uh, Europe with flow track that summer, my goal was to ask Usain Bolt a question, you know, at a press conference or whatever it was. And the first chance I get is at the Paris Diamond League press conference, pre-race press conference. I said, any question for Usain Bolt? My hand shoots up and I didn't really have a question. Uh, <laughs> and so my, the guy calls on me and he goes, all right, we'll go to him right in the front. And I take the mic and I say something. And I have no idea what I said. It's not even a question. Um, it's it's a just a couple words, I think. And for some somehow he got a question out of it and understood it. And that I counted that. I was like, all right, mission accomplished, Chris. You got your, your, your summer goal out of the way. But and then I got the opportunity to ask him another question again um, in London. I'm pretty sure uh, at the pre race press conference there. So. I do that. And at this point, like now he's seen me in Paris and in London at the same time. Um, so after his race at the London diamond league, I, he, he comes through the media mix zone and I'm just standing there. I'm like, all right, I guess like I'll ask him a question whenever he like parks himself somewhere and he stands right in front of me. So what ends up happening is every reporter hordes around me and now I'm front and center with him. And as everyone's like getting settled, he just like looks down and sees me and he goes, oh, what's up, youngin? And then uh, I was like, that was pretty cool. Uh, but then I ask him a question. And so then I, I, you know, whatever it was, it was something normal. Um, and then I noticed like there's still a ton of reports. I can't move. I can't leave this spot. And I look over the corner of my eye. There's a bunch of fans peeking over at the side, taking photos of Bolt getting interviewed. And I was like, holy shit, I'm in front of I'm in front and center of all those photos with Usain Bolt. I need to get those photos from those fans. So as soon as he starts walking away, I run over to the fans and I'm like, hey, I start calling and yelling at them. Thankfully, like I'm in London and they understand English. I'm yelling at them and they're like, what's what's going on? And all that kind of stuff. It's like you guys are just taking photos of like Usain Bolt getting interviewed. Right. And they're like, yeah, yeah. And I was like can I have those photos? Cause I'm right in front of him. And they're like, yeah, sure. It's like, what's your email? We'll, we'll email them to you. And I was like, no, 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 no. I was like, what's your email? Because I know you guys are never going to contact me. Yeah. So, um, I got their email and then a couple weeks later, I ended up getting these photos and they were awesome. Like it's, I think it was, I had it as my Facebook profile picture for like the longest time. And, um, you know, I would never do the fan esque photo doing like the Usain Bolt yeah. pose. Cause that would be like a little bit unprofessional in, in my capacity, but then, you know, getting, getting that an action shot of me being, you know, a little bit of a reporter there. And at the same time being front and center with the world's fastest man, that was awesome. So, you know, a couple, uh, years later, I've gotten a chance to sit down with him one-on-one -on -one multiple times now. And so like the nerves have worn off, but those are the Usain Bolt like interview stories. And I think summer 2013 really was like the peak of it that's amazing <laughs> i mean i would definitely be peeing myself if i oh, was yeah. standing next to usain bolt so i mean he's all, i mean he's also like super tall so like, that, that's yeah. Is, like, you're like yeah he's way up there <laughs> yeah he's six five i think or something like that and so really funny enough the last time that he was in new york city like i got an email from like one of his press people asking if i wanted to sit down with him um and I was like, yeah, sure. Like, I'll come on by. So I met him like it was like a couple blocks away from Central Park. And 
uh, I was actually also texting my best friend who's out here and he runs with me. And I said to him, I was like, Hey, do you want to meet Usain Bolt? And he was like, uh, yeah, a hundred percent. Like he was like, say, say less. And he's like, tell me where and when I have to, be, where I have to be. So he shows up to the thing too. And I have him as my, my camera guy. Uh, he literally would just stood there with my iPhone recording the whole entire interview. But it, then afterwards, like he managed, he happened to get a picture with him. But, um, what my friend I think tells me his big takeaway from that moment, being a camera guy for like, five, 10 minutes was just that like, I think it was like the New York times or someone interviewed him right before me. And then I went up and it was like two very different interviews. And I think that's something that's a little bit interesting. It's like, I'm able to turn on and turn off sort of different times of like, uh, the level of professionalism, not really the professionalism, but the capital J journalists like right. level where, yeah, that person is probably asking him, was like, are you thinking of a comeback and all that kind of stuff in 2021 or 2020, all that kind of stuff. He's get, he's gets the same questions constantly. Right, but yeah. for me, I asked him, it was like, Hey dude, you don't follow Justin Gatlin on Instagram. Like what's up with that? And that kind of stuff. Or like yeah. you follow like Zion Williamson, like what impresses you the most about him? And, I, and, and like, so it was a little bit more fun. And like, I think broke up just, sort of the typical, you know, every single same question you get. So like, that's just something that I think I like to keep in mind too, or it's just like, keep it fresh, keep it unique and, and a little bit different than what, what everyone else has to offer. Yeah, definitely. And I consider when, when everyone knows something like that, when he's already answered that question 10 times, it's just like common knowledge. Like, why would you ask it again? You can look it up. Like, yeah. like why, why don't you? So, so definitely going with the angle of, telling someone's story. And that's also a lot more exciting. I mean, the storyline is the whole thing. If you, if you see someone run a 345 mile, you're like, okay, that's impressive. But then you forget about it the next day. But if you know their story and you're like, oh, they were in the military and they ran this and they did yeah. this, it's totally more catching. And so understanding some of those dynamics behind the scene of like, who, why did you follow this person on Instagram? Like what's going on, man? Like that's what, that's what people yeah. can actually relate to. And we got to keep that. Yeah. Up. Try and Yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. Like, yeah, we try should, and stir uh, up a little bit of shit here and there. And all, uh, at the same yeah. time, too, is like, I, I also saw it as like, this is my opportunity to finally ask the guy if he can break five for the mile. I know I haven't been able to do so yet, but I wanted to know if he like has ever done it or like ever thought about it. And he was like, no, he's like, uh, I've never given any sort of thought. I have no interest in doing it. And then I asked him, I was like, all right, so a race around a lap around Central Park, like, would you yeah. beat me? And he goes, no, you've got it. And I was like, I was like, all right. <laughs> I've got the world's fastest man, like admitting to a race that I would beat him at. I'll, I'll take this. <laughs> See, that's, that's pretty solid. That's pretty solid. <laughs> uh, when so when I was on uh, City of Smag with you, we kind of talked a little bit about uh, like the beer mile. Could we get professional runners to do the beer mile, etc.? Um, and we kind of touched on like who are some of the you know the beer milers that you know aren't afraid to have a few beers here and there. So uh, maybe let's just rehash that conversation here and and revisit could we potentially see and from your perspective knowing all these all these people could do you think we could actually realistically see a beer mile with some pro runners in it say like september october time frame post olympics post europe tour um and and then again who would be really good at it who are some of the I guess party animals of the pro runners, even though they're not truly. I don't think if you just drink in the off season, you're a party animal. But <laughs> regardless, who are some of those party animals that could be contenders and would would actually be willing to show up for something like that? Yeah. So we taped our podcast in like what October it was. Um, October, yeah. Yep. And this is sort. It was still like sort of like the weird period where it's like maybe we can squeeze in a beer mile soon. But then I think uh, the idea was Eric Jenkins, who I've seen pound the fastest possible like smirnoff ice like what you've said the time it, it, the fastest chug for smirnoff ice it will anything really is what five seconds or less yeah maybe yeah. high fours or around five that's about as fast as it comes out of the bottle so there's a chance eric jenkins is right there like around <laughs> those, those sort of times we're good. for that so I, I, I've seen him chug really fast. And so like he's top of my list, possibly the guy who has a lot of potential to run a fast beer mile. Um, I, I think you threw out Craig Engels, which I agree. Like he, he's a guy who's known to enjoy beers and, and runs fast. That's the perfect combination. Yep. Makes sense. Um, sneakily, I, I forget who I was talking to. Someone I think might've listened to the podcast episode we did. They said 
Oh no, it was Pat DeSabato, our friend. He texted yeah, us yeah. and he said, don't sleep on Johnny Rigoric as a possible yeah. good beer miler. And I agree. I mean, the guys are in 349. I think like if yeah. he could, if he could slug him back pretty quick, then he'd be interesting. So I think like it is very likely that we can get a professional beer mile on the calendar at some point in September, October of 2021 this year. Um, what I would suggest actually is let's do it here in New York. Um, okay. So you guys would come out for this and we would schedule it the day after or the, uh, or maybe the night of fifth Avenue mile kind of crap. Like what you do is yeah. sort of, you take advantage of the pros being in town. Um, that's typically when they end their season yeah. and then add this sort of to their calendar or at least to their radar so that they know it's like, maybe I won't fly out on, Sunday, I'll fly out on, you know, Monday or whatever it is. And so find we'll find a track. We'll do it there. Um, tell these guys to keep it kind of low key under wraps, have yeah. everyone show up and then just do it. I think that's the way to get the pros. The incentive is really comes down to the prize purse. The prize purse has to be good. I think I know the interest is in you competing as well, um, right. because that's, that's honestly what the, how the ideal one when you watch, uh, we talked about this where it's like when you watch the Olympics, you kind of want to see there's that viral tweet of like, how would the average person fare in this yeah. sort of race? Right. And yeah. so uh, even in swimming, you have the line of the world record. You can yeah. see it. You would be that hypothetical American record, right. world record line going at that sort of pace or at least like the top end of it. Now, it's seeing how these guys approach it, whether they'll be pounding the beers fast and trying to like sprint out and make it and, and keep up with you or like there's a lot of strategy involved and I think it'd be really interesting to see. So if it's like a beer mile media type venture for this type of thing, I would suggest upping the prize money, taking yourself out of the running for the prize money yep. and just, you know, giving it to the top pro, maybe one, two, three, really incentivizing it for multiple people to go head to head. And it happens. I think. I like that. I like that. And I, and I was kind of thinking of the angle of, so say, say the prize money would be, just throwing it out there, like 3000 for the winner, 2000 for second, 1000 for third. But if any of them beat me, it's like a $2,000 bonus. So oh, a hundred percent. So basically, yeah. so there's, so someone's still going to walk away with money by doing it. But then also like if I beat them, I keep all, I keep that extra money, but if yeah, I, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think that's kind of the, the play that I'm thinking about. And I think, I think I could get some, like, I'd, I'd be willing to put up my own money as well. Beer mile media money, but also, uh, the directors of the like the beer mile world championships beer mile world classic i think they would also be oh, willing to sure. put up some money there too so i think we could accumulate a prize purse oh 100 percent. well yeah and, that, like, and that's really what it is it has to be end of season but still they're in shape so it's yeah. like maybe within a week or two of that end of season window yeah and like really it does come down to sort of man i'm trying to think it's like keeping it under wraps a little bit getting the word out and yeah, I mean the timing of it would just be perfect. Plus, like New York, like it, it's it's people would want to stick around and like and like at least like get it done here. Like I think it, I think it's possible, very possible. I like it, man. I'm excited. I know what I'm <laughs> training for next year. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, does, does it matter if any of the big marathons? Well, <laughs> yeah. I think I think the winner Fifth Ave only takes home a thousand dollars. So like, Jeez. just make it more than that. There you yeah, go. I was gonna say I, I, that's what I'm just thinking. It's like if you offer three K, like they're gonna be in town for the Fifth Avenue Mile, but really they're going to be in town for <laughs> the Beer Mile. Everybody's sandbagging the Fifth. Avenue. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're all going easy so they can save up for the next yeah. day. The real yeah, here, here's a question for you, just sort of like in because uh, I know like something like Fifth Avenue Mile, like they have the premium in the middle of the race where it's like if you are the first person to cross at a thousand or twelve hundred meters or something right. like that then they they offer that sort of premium but you still have to break four minutes what what sort of premium could you offer up in a beer mile where it's like could you be the guy leading at 800 but you you can't throw up like and finish the race by like a certain oh. time yeah that's perfect actually i think what you just said actually works well because I could incentivize them to go out hard, knowing that yeah. the harder they go out, the harder they'll be breathing and the more likely they will be to vomit. And so it's like, can you, can you be ahead of Chris at 800 
and not puke and finish and, and say finish under six minutes or something like just finish but yeah it doesn't have to be super fast i i like that yeah i like that because then that'll be keep it on it'll keep me honest too like maybe they'll pull me to a good time because they're like way yeah, ahead I mean, on, yeah. on the first lap they're gonna my prediction is on the first lap they'd be way ahead of me they're gonna go out in 56 and be yeah way ahead of me and then it's just a matter of can they still chug the second third fourth beers as well so that'll be the at, their, at their sort of worst do you see like a like what i i don't know as much about beer mile history but like what is the fastest beer mile when it comes to just like the overall field like most guys under five like do you remember like the race because like that could be another thing to like keep tabs on too like what if this yeah. is the race that has like five or six guys under five that would be a record because sure. it's it's very rare even at world championships um it the the likelihood of everyone who's broken five to do it on that day is really only like maybe one in three will actually do it because something's going to go up i mean especially when you're traveling internationally for a race it's like your stomach's messed up whatever it's too easy to puke so yeah. so yeah absolutely if there were if there were five to ten guys under five that would be a record absolutely a record i think usually I think probably three to four is kind of the standard for a world championship race when you have all the best guys. So we should also put up like if there are X amount of athletes under five minutes, we should we'll add like another keg to the after party or something. Like that. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think in New York, like there's like it would just have to be it'd have to be an open bar, just kind of like logistic wise, like no one's gonna crowd, especially I don't know about post COVID, like what the house party situation is going to be like, yeah. but hopefully at that point, like we get bars back to yeah, the point where like, yeah, yeah, yeah. where everyone could go to one and like first round is on your mom media. If you know, you guys break a sort of record and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm right with you. I want to see it happen. I'm, I'm super excited. And, and hopefully, uh, and, and this, this would be, this would be hard. This would only harm me, but also getting the, uh, world record, current world record holder, uh, Corey Belmore involved as well of Canada, because if, if it comes down to like, say Eric Jenkins is damn good at chugging the beers and he does actually run a sub four mile and chug the beers, then it's not going to be on me to beat him. It's going to be on Corey to beat him because <laughs> if, if it comes down to a 420 race, that's more Corey style. If it comes down to a sub 430 race, maybe, maybe I'll be there, but um, so I'll, I'll get him included as well. And maybe I'll give him some special like, Hey, if you win this thing, I'll go give you 500 bucks or something. <laughs> give him a little bit less because I know he can do it. That's the problem. <laughs> well, you know what I'm even thinking? It's it's like it'll be really funny because I think of Jenkins now as like more of a 5K guy. And like if he didn't get invited to like the Fifth Avenue mile, like all of a sudden like race organizers and someone sees him in town. It's like, what are you doing here? It's like, not the Fifth <laughs> Avenue mile field. And it's like, no, 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 I'm here for the bigger race. <laughs> Oh, that's going to be epic. Um, all right, let's get into our closing questions. Uh, the last goal, and we're going to do a little twist here. So we're going to start off with the Sidious Mag closing questions and get your take on it. So first one, what's the worst thing you've read about yourself on Let's uh, I think like very early on to podcasting, someone said I had a whiny voice and it stuck with me every single time. And like, I don't really think I could change much about it, um, but I think that's it. Someone is obsessed with saying I have tiny hands. I have normal sized hands. We're not uh, editing the video. We promise. <laughs> yeah. I, and so uh, that's always something that comes up randomly. And then there was one time where like, I think they, there was some, I forget what it was. It was like before I ran the Tokyo marathon, someone said something. And then in my recap, of like my race post race, like reflection or whatever it was, I like cited what they had said as like, ever since I read that, like it's, it's been biting at me. And so I wanted to prove this hater wrong. And that hater later on, like ended up posting on uh let's turn to be like, listen, I didn't actually wasn't trying to be mean, but if it motivated him, then, then, then that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, let, let's run. People will find anything to Don't pick, pick at. apart. Like, yeah, for sure. It's the worst. Well, I always think about it too. It's just like, you know, you can be walking down the street and if like you find like a group of school kids, they will find the little thing to make fun of you for, and it'll bite at you for the rest of the day. That's what let's run.com is. <laughs> oh yeah. Totally. Yep spot on all right you get 25 shots from half court make one you win 25 million uh you miss them all and you go to jail for 25 years do you take the shots no i'm not taking the shots like i i played basketball as a little kid like for like a year or two but I never like i've not shot a basketball in a while 
Um, I would be a hard no on this one. I tell it to all the guests too. When they say yes, I'm like, I'm a no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, half like people underestimate, I think, how big a half court shot is. Even if you have 25, I think by number, like I would have to hit 100 in order to hit one. Yeah. 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 Well, the, the pressure really begins if you missed from zero to 20. And then from there, now you're really sweating it. Yeah. That's the thing. If the pressure's on and you miss the first 10, like every one, you're just getting that much more shaky. And yeah, it, yep. your your probability goes down as the, <laughs> as the event goes on. So, um, all right. And then who would you go on a run with? Anyone, conversational pace, and where would it be? I think I've always said Derek Jeter in Central Park. Would be pretty cool for me. Is yeah. Jeter like if I think about it, there's no athlete I would get nervous in front of to interview, um, except for Derek Jeter, probably like because he was just like my hero growing up. Uh, so having a conversation with him would be really cool. Center Park is just like my favorite place to, to run, so I'd probably pick there. Um, yeah, so I think that's I'll, I'll stick with that as my answer to this day. Love it. What's your favorite race you've ever attended? Ooh, favorite race I've ever attended. Well, like the Olympics, does that count as like a like a big thing? We can uh, make an event. That's fair. Yeah, I guess you can say a one time race like like the Olympics, as well as what's your favorite yearly event that you cover or go to. I love covering the New York City Marathon. Well, that's like just like a lot of fun for me watching that. Like it's just great. It's like a huge party for the whole city. Um, the I guess like the Olympics is, would be the big event. I remember being excited about, um, I forget the order now, but it, it they were back to back. It was Bolt winning the 100 in Rio and uh, Wade Van Niekerk setting like the 400 meter world record, which was like not expected whatsoever, especially out of lane eight. So like that night in particular was like super loud at the Olympic Stadium. So like to experience that again would be amazing. Um, but to this day, I think like New York city marathon is my favorite day in the city. Sometimes like I'm, I'm a little dismayed that I have to be in the press like box and, and, and like working the entire time. Uh, because like, I'd rather be out with friends cheering people on and that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I've been on the lead cart of the Boston marathon, which is a lot of fun. So like I, I sat there and I watched, um, the year that Jordan has finished like second, um, or third, whatever it was, um, I was on like the women's lead cart because like I was kind of trying to predict this could be the year that an American woman wins. And I was like a year or two off. Um, but I sat there and I watched the whole race unfold and that was really cool. Cause it's like, I've run the race before, but seeing it unfold from the professional view was, was pretty cool. Um, so Boston and New York probably hold like the two regular events that I'll always try and attend. Well, once you have a big breakthrough in the marathon yourself at Chicago, I think you're going to change your mind. So and I'll get footage. I'll get footage of the course of you and uh -huh, it'll, yeah. it'll be great. So yeah, well, we'll yeah, try I to mean, change your mind. <laughs> yeah. Chicago holds, holds a great, you know, soft spot in my heart being my first marathon. This see, the thing is, it's like Boston has the history yeah. in general. New York is home to me. I just don't know the Chicago neighborhoods as much where it's like, if you, were to drop me off at any point of like the New York City Marathon, like I'd be able to find my way home and know, been in the neighborhood before and know where I was. Chicago's like not that way for me, where like drop me off at like mile 18, I would have no idea where I was. Uh, and so, like, I usually, like, on in a race like that, I'm just like on a mission and just trying to get to the finish or to the next, like, like I'm thinking more in like splits and like mile markers and that kind of stuff, which is kind of like another reason why running all these international marathons like Tokyo, London, and Berlin is so much fun for me is because it's great to be in a different like city, but I'm more obsessed with sort of like, all right, I'm doing mental math. It's I don't know kilometers and that kind of stuff. And that's all that they have marked off. So, um, yeah, Chicago, I think next time I run it, it'll be a little bit more special having spent more time there for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you might not remember the neighborhood at mile 18, but you'll remember that your negative splitting starting at mile 18. You're feeling yeah. good. Legs are feeling good. You're, <laughs> you're dropping those low sixes. You're crushing it. So that'd be insane. <laughs> I, I have faith in you. <laughs> um, what What's your biggest hot take going into the 2021 season? Do you have one like a big upset, 
uh, a big someone who's expected to be a favorite that just totally bombs just bombs or... it. Yeah. What What's the biggest hot take coming into 2021? And it's yeah. probably going to have to be around the Olympics because who knows what else will happen. So we can say the Olympics, but. What's my big hot take? Oh, this is interesting. This is a very on the spot question. So, yeah, I'm trying to think. Well, I think like it's intriguing to see this could be a hot one. Uh, some of these media, I mean, uh, sponsors start to lean into um, sp- sponsoring some of these influencers as opposed to like professional runners. Uh, it's very interesting to see because at the very end of the day, I think performance does ultimately matter. Um, and it's, it's a hot button topic where it's like, what I think performance speaks for itself. Like you can, you can clap back at whatever it is like, X, Y, Z person on the Bowerman track club maybe doesn't put themselves out there as much, but that's because they're focused on winning. And on, honestly, at the end of the day, it's going to show they're going to have an uptick in followers, no matter what, when, it, when they do end up making sort of like that Olympic team. So it's going to happen because of their performance as opposed to churning out Instagram posts and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, I do recognize the value of storytelling and sort of bringing people along on that journey. So it's an interesting balance where, the athletes themselves need to recognize that they need to be sort of the influencers as much as that word sucks. Uh, So in that way, I would hope that there's a little bit of a wake up call for some of these athletes, especially now we're talking in January, a lot of contracts just expired. People are unsponsored and, and, and trying to figure things out. And it's like, if you do it right, then like maybe that you wouldn't have been in sort of like this predicament. So, um, that could be a little bit of a hot take. I was trying to think more of like, Oh, like last year at this time, it would have been really cool to say like, I don't, I don't think Kipchoge is going to win a marathon and yeah, like, yeah, he yeah. didn't end up winning yeah, London. Yeah. But, uh, I think the Kipchoge redemption tour is going to be like ridiculous. Who knows how fast that guy is going to run. Oh um, yeah. And, Maybe that's the, maybe it's it's a hot take to pick Kipchoge to win a marathon. I don't think so, really. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think so. I have full faith in him. <laughs> that that guy is just he delivers. Um, yeah, but yeah, that yeah that is I do like that as a hot take because it is interesting to see when like super successful athletes get dropped entirely or even switch brands, which means they were definitely underpaid before. But then you have influencers that get signed with major major shoe companies or whatever, but not, not even for running. It's just for, for vlogging or whatever the case is. And yeah, you know, well, listen, I think what did, it, yeah, what did it, yeah, what did it for me, yeah, what did it for me was just seeing, um, the Tyler Cameron from the bachelorette, uh, two seasons ago, um, posting a Hoka ad on his Instagram feed. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering just how much that cost. Yep. And at the same time, like how much it, like would have cost to sponsor a runner or two exactly. um, like and J and Y or something like that. Yep. And so it's yep. like, it's really it's like, Hoka too. like, like no regular Joe is going to know what the hell Hoka is. Like that is, that is very a very true. running specific brand and, and runners in general are known for being very low paid. If, if you're just on the base salary, you're basically making just enough to pay your rent at a crappy place. Like you're only going to make money if you're winning medals, going to the Olympics world championships. So, yeah. so even with that in mind, it's like it pro runners, aren't expensive at base salary level at all for, no. for a company to sponsor. No. And then like you read the Instagram caption and it's like, do, do I really think Tyler Cameron wrote this whole entire thing about no. like the, the hundred K <laughs> attempt that they're going to have? Not a chance. It's, it's like, <laughs> anyway, you can play this clip back when I land a shoe deal. And then all of a sudden it's like, people are wondering how, did, how the heck did Chris Chavez land a shoe deal? <laughs> or like, why did he take the money when, uh, I don't know when he's complaining about pro runners not getting sponsored. <laughs> <laughs> what's your what's your favorite alcoholic beverage? Um, so I like to, I think I go with an old fashioned. Just like I, I like that's my my go to start. Like I think to a good night. Um, Moscow mules have always been like a safe bet for me. Um, yeah. Love, I just love how refreshing they are. But I think if I turn around and look at I got into whiskey after doing like a, that podcast I do with Des Linden. Um, and she taught me a thing or two about whiskey. Uh, it got me drunk on that episode. Like if, you, <laughs> if you, if you go back and listen to the Sidious Mag podcast episode that I did with her, it like towards the end of it, I say it's like last question. 
like four or five times. Oh like I was just like not ready to end, let this moment end. And uh, so we actually just touched base because there's a book that I was just reading today. I started it today. It's called it's called Pappy Land, and it's um about Pappy Van Rinkle, like the 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 like awesome uh, whiskey, and it's really difficult to get and very expensive. Um, but she said, let's read this and then we'll have another, um, nice. you know, whiskey tasting. And so now I have to kind of like know my shit the next time around. Um, <laughs> so I've got a couple of whiskey, um, uh, bottles over there where that's what I've been like kind of dipping my toes into during, um, the quarantine. And I think the thing I'm most proud of is like this Yamazaki 12 bottle that I have. So it's, it, it's aged 12 years. Um, and the story behind it is also that I was in Tokyo for the Tokyo marathon, ran it. Then me and my friend go up to Kyoto, go to the distillery. And then we are in like the, we're waiting for our tour. So we go to the gift shop first and there's two bottles of the Yamazaki 12 there. And so I'm like, all right, um, let's, let's get them at the end of our tour. Like this, this is really good. Like they had us taste and all that kind of stuff. It's amazing. It's already aged 12 years. We do the tour. And by the time we get there, like they're gone. And they told us like, we're not going to have any more until like the next Wednesday. And at that point, we're not even in Tokyo. So we um, missed out on it. And then we embarked on the next like five days we had left in Tokyo. We're just stopping in every single liquor store we could find trying to find a bottle of this thing. And so my friend ended up going into a bodega like it looked like a bodega in Japan. I don't know if, what the word for it would be yeah. popped in. He went in to buy a bottle of water or something like that. And behind the counter, there was like one of them and he asked it was like is that a yamazaki 12 and they said yes and they said how much is it and it was like 200 bucks or something like that which like and i come back to the states and i found out you could get it for like 120 or like or, or a little bit more <laughs> or, it, somewhere around there and so when he's like they they told him they had two so at that point i was like i have to get one too and so like <laughs> we bought both bottles brought them back and we said we'd save them for a special occasion. So like that's sitting there. It's almost two years old from when I got it. So like it's getting better. And the occasion I've decided that um, will be worth it is getting the vaccine. So like for me, once I get vaccinated, I'm opening that thing up and I'm putting it in a glass and I'm enjoying it because oh, like yeah. it, I think that's a good enough sort of occasion given the circumstances of the last year or so. Heck yeah. It, yes, absolutely <laughs> will be. <laughs> uh, switching subjects a little bit, what's your favorite genre of music and or artist that you're currently listening to? Um, I am a wide range of music. Uh, like my Spotify year in review is just like kind of all over the place um, because I'm literally, I could go from listening to uh, Bruce Springsteen uh, one hour and then the next hour be listening to ABBA and then the next one is like Roddy Rich like it's literally that wide ranging so if I were to pick I, I, I like Bruce's new album that's kind of like what I've been listening to a lot of recently um, Mumford and Sons is a classic to pick like I've seen them I think that's the band I've seen live the most um, I've seen them like three or four times so um but if I could, you know, time travel and go anywhere, like, I, I don't know, Michael Jackson's always like a safe pick when it comes to music. Like, I would love to have gone to a concert of his. Um, so, yeah, Neymar, I think uh, I'm all over the place and that kind of stuff. The, here's a fun question. I'll flip on, on the two of you. Okay. Uh, and this is one that I've brought up with a couple of friends of mine, too, recently. It's if you could attend one concert uh, ever, what would it be? Cool. So for me, I, I think I have an answer, so I'll go first. I, so growing up, um, my dad was super into like classic rock and had you know cassette tapes of like every rock band, et cetera. And I loved Guns N' Roses growing up. And I just think like rock live in general, n not a specific performance of it, but just any like Guns N' Roses in an arena and I'm in the like close to the front and you're just like the guitar solos, the like the energy, the drugs, like everything, <laughs> like all the all the crazy people in the audience, like shooting up or doing whatever they're doing. I think like that that scene in like the 80s or or whatever. I think I think I would go with something like that. 
Yeah, it's funny. Uh, mine's like a similar answer with uh, like the OG ACDC because just because like I think I was I was watching a video and it was so shocking to me because I have like this you see like a, a movie or, or a TV show and there's like a lot of people there's a crowded area because like it was filmed pre COVID. <laughs> But like looking at one, like a couple ACD, uh, like these huge venues where it's just like seas of people. I'm like, holy shit. Like not only are they shooting up with whatever, but like there's got to be some <laughs> diseases that are swapping. But I still think it would be super cool to go to. My, that's how we feel about like Live Aid. I've seen, I've watched, I, I think I put that on like once a week when I'm just like doing chores yeah. around the, the apartment. Is like Live Aid with Queen and that kind of stuff. That would be my pick. But like nowadays I look at the crowds, I'm like, there's something there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and it's not just like stories, you know, that you hear or whatever. Like right. my, my parents, growing up in that time went to like acdc concert i don't know if they went to guns and roses but acdc and they specifically said like they were kind of in the back like on one side of them was a dude getting head and on the <laughs> other side of them were, were people snorting coke and i was like that sounds crazy like <laughs> let's let's, we gotta, let's live a little <laughs> let's, let's yeah. live a little <laughs> See, the funny thing is, like, people bring up, it's like, once we return back to, you know, full scale normalcy, like, that's what's going to be back in our face. And then I always think it was like, yeah, but, you know, as much as we can say we look forward to that, when we're in that moment, we're gonna be like, I'd rather be home. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> exactly. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. This is overwhelming. Like, guaranteed the first the first bar that I go to after COVID, I'm like, wow, this is great. And then I'm like, mm, my lower back hurts because I've been... <laughs> And my two hundred dollar bar tab, and, and yeah. I feel yeah, I feel also, terrible. Also, I also I don't like people. Why am I here? <laughs> <laughs> All right, last couple here. Um, our our listeners seem to really kind of dig these weird abstract ones, so we'll we'll keep them in. Um, it was kind of just funny the first couple episodes, but I guess we're going <laughs> with stuck. it. <laughs> so the first one is how many holes does a straw have? I see. I think I posed this on the Sidious Mag Twitter once because I used the the baton and I was like, how many holes does a baton exactly. have? Same question. I would go, I go one. It's just like straight. It's just one. It just goes straight down. Right. I think I, I change my answer every you, time. You do change it every time. Okay. Okay. But the past couple have been one and I'm like, well, yeah, you, you dig a hole to China. It's a hole. It's a, yeah. Yeah. I think you started a two guy. Because, I started to then, and then we Jason to convinced me to be a zero guy. And then I was like, <laughs> we had someone say that a, 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 like a pawn is really just a plane that's rolled into a, this shape. And so it's it's not even any holes. It's just it's like that guy's a, a psychopath. That guy's that's, a psychopath. That's, yeah, that's, that's crazy. Uh, yeah, we, we keep flipping. Um, but I don't know. I think I'm in the I think I'm in the one camp as well. Yeah, I'm pretty convinced for now until for the now. better argument comes along. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next one being, is a hot dog a sandwich? Yeah. So let me see if I could dig it up right here. I've got a whole, um, I've actually written about this. Um, <laughs> let me see. And I'll read you. Um, it's based on Plato's theory of forms. Uh, oh, man. That's funny <laughs> that you say that because at, uh, at a work event, both Jake and David uh, had this exact same conversation. And that hmm. was... That was the Jake's, reference. That was Jake's reference. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so workers. Okay. this will take, it, according to the post that I wrote, it'll take like two two seconds to read because it was like, um, it was Anthony Rizzo from the Chicago Cubs. Yeah. Once tweeted in January two thousand seventeen, having a debate right now is a hot dog a sandwich, and me and my friend uh, decided to write. Well, Anthony, here is the truest ph philosophical answer to a question that admittedly carries some ambiguity: everything is a sandwich. By that, I mean everything has some sort of sandwich-like property, but of course some things are more sandwich than others. For example, a Reuben would have been more sandwich-like properties than toast and peanut butter, but toast and peanut butter has more sandwich-like properties than, say, pasta. Hot dogs and tacos have sandwich-like properties, and it's not incorrect to label them as such, but it's less incorrect than labeling BLT or grilled chicken sandwich a sandwich. Likewise, an ice cream sandwich is a sandwich. It has sandwich-like properties. But you might argue that because it doesn't have bread, that's a truly defining characteristic of a sandwich. But it's only, uh, but it's only defining character. Well, lacking that quality makes 
open face sandwich is less of a sandwich than full sandwiches. But even open face sandwiches have some sandwich like properties. And while an ice cream sandwich lacks bread, it compensates by being in the form of a sandwich. <laughs> Hot dogs don't have bread, but a bun is also made up of carbs. And a bun, which is really different than a sub sandwich bread, which we, is what we would call a sandwich. So by the same token, tortillas and taco shells accomplish the same ends as bread. These are all properties that shape our idea of what a sandwich is. And I would recommend reading Plato's Theory of Forms, which explains how ideas make up reality. Maybe we can discuss this over sandwiches, say at Lucky's in Wrigleyville. That's definitely a sandwich. Damn, thanks that, for pulling that out. That's, that is the best answer I've ever I heard. Mean, well, <laughs> that's amazing. That's ama so, I mean, like everything in life, there's no black and white. It's like the spectrum and you got to, where's the hot dog compared to the ice cream sandwich yeah. compared to the Reuben compared? Everything's a sandwich. Just Man. like, what, what, what is it that people are saying is like, is something ravioli or something like that? I keep forgetting. Oh, our Pop-Tarts ravioli. Yeah. So yes, everything's ravioli. Just some things have more, more ravioli like on, qualities. On that pop tarts or ravioli, I think. Oh <laughs> man. <laughs> well, now I, I think we're gonna have to remove that question going forward because you just you shut it. down. Yeah, yeah, you won the question. So we're gonna shut it down going forward now. <laughs> Retire the question. We should just like make a like make an Instagram meme where we like have Chris's jersey and like we're retiring the question. <laughs> I like it. All right. <laughs> Okay. And final one to close it out. You have one day left to live. Money is not an object. How do you want to spend your last day? Oh, man. That's tough. I'd, I'd probably I'd probably be here in New York City. Um, and this is in like, it's already so tough to think because I'm like, just, I think of like what I'm limited in doing with COVID right now, right. that it's like, what is it that I want to do once I have like that liberty again? I don't know. I think the day starts off with a nice long run in Central Park. Then after that, going to like a Yankee game. But before that, going to like the bars outside Yankee Stadium, watching the Yankees like beat the Red Sox or something like that. Going to the bars afterwards, maybe ending up at like a cocktail bar in Manhattan or something like that. Just staying with friends constantly the entire time. Um, and then really out into the early hours of the following morning, you know, in New York City, because that typically is a thing. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of it. Like, it would be it would be a good long run in New York City, going to the Yankee game, bars with friends. That's kind of all I really need. That's I love it. That's great. We'll that's have to great. we'll have to start training in terms of being able to stay up. Like last time I was in New York City, at like I was very confused because we were still up at like three thirty in the morning and like having like having like food. I was like, this is yeah. The night the nightlife in New York City is a step above Chicago for sure. Oh, yeah. They're very yeah. few bars open past two a.m. here, uh, and and most people don't don't have the uh, usually we're the ones closing. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> if we're closing the bar, it's usually the you know closing last call at one thirty a.m. Right, but right. yeah. Not not many people have the stamina in the Midwest to to make it till four or five. Well, six. you guys you guys just don't have the diners. I think that's like the key component, yeah, like the twenty four hour diners. That's what really gets people through in New York. Is like you you stay out, but you're rewarded with like a good meal at a diner where you can get an omelet at like two thirty in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, whenever it is. I think diners are the real uh, the game changer there. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah, we really got like cheap cheap drunk food, fried food, pizza, or like an IHOP. And that's basically, that's like, <laughs> IHOP's open 24 hours. That's yeah. about it. So, oh, that's, yeah, that's a good perspective. Yeah. Awesome. Chris, thanks for coming on. Anything, any words of advice, words of wisdom you want to leave our listeners with closing out? No, I mean, you guys, this is a lot of fun. You guys are great. And like, I think uh, I'm really looking forward to making uh, this beer mile happen. And hopefully we can do, we do it in New York City post Fifth Avenue mile this year um like I, I i can already picture it so like let's let's make that a reality i love it i love it absolutely awesome thanks a bunch chris yeah no problem that was chris chavez of sidious mag of sports illustrated of being the guy that everyone knows in the running world we hope you enjoyed that one it was an absolute blast to catch up with him it wouldn't be a beer mile podcast without us doing our beer of the week uh, so let's get started in reviewing it, huh? Let's get started. So my beer of choice this week for the interview with Chris was this 
Wyhen Stepner. I don't know. I, I purposely butchered that. If you if you do know the correct pronunciation, please like link us to it. Yeah, please do. I, I didn't learn German in high school and college. I learned Spanish, but I went with this one. There's a bar in Chicago called Prost. They sell steins and boots of some really tasty beers, including Vitus. And so I saw this at uh, Binnie's in Chicago, bought it. This is a fire beer, not gonna lie. It's, it's definitely good. something nicer. 7.7% alcohol, imported. Uh, highly recommend it if a store near you has it. It's hard to find. So there's a, there's a chance that you won't find it, but Vitus, check it out. I'm gonna rate it. Oh man, so part so part of me again with any beer, it's like the memories and the nostalgia, like going back to yeah. what do you think about this beer? And for me, it's like the the few times I've been at Prost for like someone's birthday party, and you're ordering like a, a like a half gallon stein yeah, of this thing. It's, or it's a, a very like celebratory beer too. It is, it is. So I I think drinkability, I'll give a little bit lower just because. Well, I don't know. I can drink a stein of it pretty easily, <laughs> but I will say like an eight on drinkability and a nine on taste, and then the X factor. I feel like every beer is a 10 X factor. There, there's one reason or another that it's just like- Okay, this clicks. X factor is, it's like the drinkability is an eight, the taste is a nine, and it's 7.7%. .7%. That's true, that's so, true. And it doesn't taste like it, so it's like, it's very sneaky. Definitely, yeah. especially in a stein. Yeah, and Adam was not drinking this today. So He's I, got a different drink of choice. I'm feeling a little bit under the weather. Don't worry, it's not COVID. I got my rapid test uh, earlier today came back negative um, so what I'm doing is I have been pounding Pedialyte because I'm trying to hydrate and fight whatever cold I have uh, so today I'm reviewing Pedialyte versus uh, I think this is Walmart's brand parents choice uh, they're they're both pediatric electrolyte solutions um, but let's you know let's give it a go let's give it a go so what do we we have a P the the name brand Pedialyte we have a grape and then the and then this off is mixed, brand mi mixed fruit mixed fruit and honestly kind of tastes like um, you know that like medicine you take when you're you know, younger what is it it's well like, like the, it's just like so cough syrup but like yeah that, I think cough syrup's technically cherry yes but it's like still but it's that it's same it tastes like that mixed fruit it's, okay it's okay I don't know even like drinkability obviously Pedialyte is like infinity because. It's hydrating. It's really good. Best drink out um, there. Taste for that, I would give it like a seven. It's good, but uh, there's obviously better. Yeah. This one seems less dense. So if I if I'm looking at the name brand Pedialyte, the the liquid seems clearer than the maybe it's just the flavor of it, but it yeah. almost looks like you're getting ripped actually, off with the name brand. Well, there actually is um there is a clear Pedialyte. Which That's true. So I don't know what it tastes like. I don't think I've had one of those. But the grape, I can attest, is my favorite. Obviously, I bought like five of them today. <laughs> I'm in it for the long haul. I really despise being sick, so trying to be hydrated. But for the taste on this, I would, I would give it like uh, probably like a nine, I think. Definitely. So the opacity doesn't necessarily indicate the, the taste the level. The flavor. I don't think so. Because okay. they do have that clear one. Okay. Um, okay. Which again, I don't know what it tastes like. Maybe I'll get that next. Next time I'm sick, we'll review that one on the podcast. Perfect. I, I drink them all, so I think they're all good equally. Uh, Pedialyte, best pre-workout, post-workout, post-sickness, post-drinking, pre-drinking. I, I mean, it's just the best for everything. I mean, it's the, it's the it's the drink for life, you know? Abbott, sponsor us. Hit, hit seriously, up. hit us up. Sponsor us. Um, yeah. And we do have a new Stupid Challenge video coming out. The exact date of the release TBD, but in the near future. And in that episode, we attempt a Ben & Jerry sponsorship. So, you know, we're, we're attempting the Pedialyte sponsorship, attempting the Ben & Jerry sponsorship. That's all I'll say right now. You know, it's a cash grab. We, we like money. We like doing stupid stuff for money too, so. But, but for Ben & Jerry's, we just do it for the ice cream. We don't need the money. Yeah, yeah, but it'd be great to just get free bread, Ben and Jerry's. You know? Yeah, free Ben, exactly, exactly. Just do it for the the product, you know. You know? Yeah, that, and that's enough. Pedialyte. I mean, if you just send us a couple boxes of this a week, oh. I mean, that's enough. Oh, we're yeah, we're not asking for money. We're just asking for product. Exactly, exactly. The other beer of the week. Surprise, surprise twist. There's Two <laughs> beers of the week. Or actually, three drinks of the week. Yeah, yeah. The other beer of the week, because I. 
you know, only had this one. So I had, and, and for those that are just listening to the audio, I only had the V2s. Um, and then I wanted to, uh, you know, maybe have another one set aside just in case the conversation with Chris went a bit. And so I had a hams. Now, the hams, what do, what do we think about the hams? Now, this is one that Adam has actually had and remembers because it's somewhat recent. So I've never what remember do, hams. What does Adam think of the hams? You don't remember the hams? I don't remember ever drinking hams. Anytime I get convinced to drink hams, I'm never in a state that I can, like, like there's, you know how you can't give consent if like you're already drunk? I can't give consent to drink hams because I'm already drunk. So you've never started with the hams? Oh God, no. <laughs> Why would you do that? I mean, I know I got shit for drinking a Budweiser instead of that Porter a couple episodes ago, but like hams versus V2s is like another level of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it wasn't an enjoyable switch. I'll, I'll say that, but uh yeah, hams is one of those things. I feel like it's uh, it's kind of like when you get into coffee or wine. It's like I keep drinking it to try to get myself to like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of one of those things. I mean, it's it's a cheap 30 rack. It's like one of the cheapest in Chicago, if not the cheapest, depending on where you go. So it, it, you can't go wrong when will, it comes to that regard. I but... will say the, the X factor for hams is playing Sink the Biz, uh, which we'll prob- I'm sure we'll do it. An episode Great on uh, in the future, but I'm sure you can Google it uh, for the time being. They are easy to delete, no doubt about that. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really have anything else to say about hams. I mean, I'll give it like a four to five on the taste, and maybe a eight to nine on the drinkability. I, that, that's fair. There, there's also the factor of like the first beer that you start drinking. The drinkability is going to be low if it doesn't taste good because you don't want to keep drinking it. So it's really Agreed. a drinkability like. It goes up to 10 after you've had three or so, but the first couple, yeah, it maybe should, starts we, at five and then it's like a seven and then it's like a 10. We should really be graphing the, the drinkability. The drinkability is a graph. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Maybe even the taste too, who knows. Um, so there you have it. That's the Beer Mile podcast for this week. Uh, so 12. Episode 12. Man, yeah. who would have thought we'd make it this far? Plus, ep- well, so we had episode zero. We also had two bonus episodes. And one that we haven't released because it's bad. And it's because it's bad. So, I mean, we, we're like, we're already hitting 15 episodes. Who would have thought we would have made it this far? I mean, I knew we would because I believe in us, but I we're not quitters. But anyway, we're still here. Episode 12, Chris Chavez. Make sure to listen to the Sidious Mag podcast if you don't, because it's a good one. Uh, make sure you subscribe. Leave us a review on iTunes. Well, I guess it's Apple Podcasts now, if you'd be so kind. We actually have five reviews. Oh, or not five reviews, five ratings on Apple Podcasts. All five How stars. Are we doing? All Very five good. stars. All right. So here's another way to earn some swag, especially if you're still listening this far, because it's probably like five percent of people. If you leave a review on Apple Podcasts, take a screenshot of it, and then DM either Adam or I on Instagram or our account, The Beer Bottle on Instagram. We'll for sure send you some swag. Just thank you for reviewing it, rating it five stars. If you rate it Definitely. one star. You'll also get some swag. No, actually, no, you won't. No, you won't. We don't want any one-star ratings. We'll be screwed for life. (laughs) Five stars only. Leave us a review. DM us. We'll send you some swag to thank you for doing it. Um, Because we definitely appreciate that. And if you're still listening to this, we also appreciate that. So, agreed. Any closing, closing advice? Closing words of wisdom? I've already done the, if you, whether you think you can or think you can't. You're right. I, let's do it again. That's right. before we had clout, you know. So it's... <laughs> we, we, we have clout now. Ask uh, Spencer Brown, athlete special. That's right. He knows what clout is. He knows what the clout is. All right. Uh, yeah, parting words of wisdom. Whether you think you can or think you can't, you're probably right. Oh, that's going to be such a good cut. That's going somewhere with that. That's going to be such a good cut. Okay. (laughs) Okay, okay.